everybody, welcome back to Project Happy Home. For those of you who are new here, I'm Tanya, a doctor, lawyer, turned homeschool mom of three kids ages 11, 8, and 6. If you're interested in videos about secular homeschooling, raising a child with ADHD, and living a more essentialist lifestyle, be sure to hit that subscribe button down below. In today's video, I am joined by my good friend Danielle over at Take Care Mama, and we are going to be chatting about IEPs. Specifically, what is an IEP and how can you prepare for those meetings and best utilize an IEP throughout the year so that your child benefits the most from it? One of the first questions people have about IEPs or individualized education plans or programs is how are they different from a 504, which they've also heard about. Now, they are very similar and a lot of the things that are in an IEP can be in a 504, but an IEP generally includes much more than a 504 might. For example, a 504 can be something that is very temporary, like when a child injures themselves and needs special accommodations for seating, for example, um, if they have a broken leg, etc. Or it can be for a temporary uh, visual situation mm -hmm. or a medical situation. And generally, they are much more circumspect. They are much more um, directed to one specific area of need, one specific accommodation. In contrast, an IEP is really like an entire roadmap and plan to address not only the child's diagnoses or specific medical need, but everything else that flows from that, specific education plans, specific accommodations, specific timelines and targets and it really does involve many more people and also like a much bigger framework for supporting your child. So that on its surface level is one of the biggest differences between an IEP and a 504 plan. For your child to receive a specialized education service in your school environment on an ongoing basis in a focused, well thought out way, an IEP is really essential. I actually pulled my son out uh, of school before he started first grade and before we really got into the nitty gritty of what an IEP would entail. Danielle, on the other hand, has her son in school and I will have great information available to you on her personal experience with IEPs. I, on the other hand, actually pulled my son out of school before he started first grade, so before I really got into the process of being the parent on the side of the IEP meeting table. However, I have been on the other side of the table as a teacher because I taught seventh grade science for two years. And from that perspective, I have some advice to offer, I think, and also as the mom of someone with ADHD who I teach on a daily basis. I would say when you first go to that meeting, that first IEP meeting, your entire IEP team should be there if not, all the key players should be there. You should get to know who they are and they should get to know you and where you're coming from, what your family situation is. Sometimes it can feel very threatening. I've noticed some parents approach those meetings with a feeling of, you know, I don't know what this is. I don't know what it's going to be going forward. I don't know whether they're on our side or whether they're not on our side. I would go in with the assumption that everyone at that meeting is on your side and is on your child's side. Go in hoping and believing the best of all of those people there. And with this collaborative attitude, I think having a collaborative attitude, acknowledging that there have been difficulties in the classroom environment because of how your child's brain wiring is, you know, is important. I don't think you need to be a victim in that situation. I don't think you should feel like your child is either. This is a meeting to establish an education plan for your child that best serves them, right? That that is the goal. Everybody at that table should have that child's best interest at heart. And if you go forward with that initial presumption, I think the interaction can be a lot smoother going forward. One of the most important parts of that IEP meeting will be establishing the plan and the IEP goals. What are the goals for the student? What do they feel like your student should be able to achieve? And what do you feel like your child should be able to achieve? How are those goals going to be measured? Are there going to be checkpoints along the way? Monthly checkpoints, weekly checkpoints, semester by semester? How often is the IEP team going to communicate with you? What are your responsibilities in terms of communicating with them? What are their responsibilities in terms of communicating with you? Who is the point person? You know, before you leave that meeting, you should know if I have a question about this, who am I emailing? Am I emailing everybody on this team or am I emailing one point person? Emailing one point person is often the most efficient way of getting things done. However, that really does depend upon your school district, your particular team, etc. But get those questions answered for yourself. When they lay out the goals, make sure you have a way of assessing the progress in those goals. 
And this is where Datability comes in. So I haven't mentioned Datability before, but they are a company that provides an online form of data keeping and record keeping so that you can have measurable smart goals for your child in this IEP process. So that as you're evaluating how your child is reading better or paying attention better or turning in homework better, whatever those specific goals are, you can clearly create them, track them, and record progress both on a graphic level as well as with handwritten notes or typed in notes. You can set the time period of any specific goal. You can also change the framework of how they're evaluated, whether it's a checklist, whether it's being checked off, whether it's an actual qualitative assessment of progress, etc. So it gives you this objective measure of assessing that student's progress. And the way Datability is set up, the teachers and the IEP team can have access to it as well as the parent. And you can actually use Datability even as a homeschool parent just to assess on, in an objective way your student's progress. We all have the tendency to notice when bad things happen. And I think particularly with children with ADHD in a classroom environment, a lot of times you'll see all these like negative notes on the calendar or the assessment form because those are the things that people remember. Those are the things that stand out. The incident that happened that was unfortunate. You know, they don't remember the little things that you're assessing. Like, oh, this time he did do like 80% of the assignment as opposed to last week when it was 50% of the assignment, etc. And I think that having clear, measurable checkpoints, you know, things that you're looking for to succeed in are really, really helpful. And Datability gives you a way to do that. And it gives you a collaborative tool that everybody can see that gives you a way to assess the student's progress. Because sometimes it's helpful for the school team to see how the student might be doing well or progressing in their home tasks and their executive functioning skills in keeping their book bag clean or getting to the breakfast table on time or putting on their shoes properly, remembering socks, etc. There's so many different factors that we can look at and so many different measurable points of success that we can assess on our uh, students' journey. So I was really impressed with Databilities format, its ease of use. As a homeschool parent myself, personally, I see my child on such a one-on-one -on -one basis every single day that I didn't really feel the need to use that ability in my own home. But if I was sending my student to school, if I was sending my eldest to school, I would really want to see a clear progression and a clear assessment of his behavior and his academic progress. And I like the way that Datability is set up because it's set up for success. It's set up to meet goals as opposed to a record of deficit. And so that's another thing I really like about it. But I will link the information about Datability in the description box down below. I will also link a video that they have up on YouTube that clearly walks you through the program where you can see more details about it. But I think that if I had a student in school and I had an IEP plan and IEP meetings, I would definitely want to employ a tool like this so that I could make this process as beneficial to my child as possible. One of my favorite websites for learning about the IEP and specifically the anatomy of an IEP is understood.org. You can go on understood.org and download their anatomy of an IEP worksheet all for free and it clearly delineates a sample IEP and what different portions you're going to look at for it. You can see on the side here that it goes through all the different sections including the student information section which you would of course expect, the present level of performance, a description of their academic performance, their skills, their behavior, the different types of things that have brought you to this meeting, like what kinds of things that they notice that have necessitated this meeting, what kinds of things that are relevant to their the student's diagnosis have been showing up in class. Um, there is a section on annual goals. So for that year, what are we all working towards? What are the objectives for this IEP for the student? How is progress gonna be reported both to the student and to you? Who else is going to receive details of this IEP plan? How does the results of the progress or the evaluation determine what might happen next year? what services are actually being offered to the student to help them be their best selves in the classroom environment. Is it an integrated classroom environment or a separated classroom environment? We wanna make this process as useful as possible. So make sure your IEP is detailed enough to really address your student. You wanna see like what is actually happening here. We don't wanna just assess a student in a bubble. We want to help them and see whether the things we're doing to help them are actually helping. 
If they're not actually helping at your next IEP meeting, that's the time to reassess that and say like, I don't think this is serving them. I don't think this is the best solution to this particular set of circumstances. What else can we try? Another section of your IEP will be the supplementary services. So if you're having any visual therapy, if you're having anyone else on that team, if there's any um, services where your student is being pulled out of class, extracurriculars, et cetera, all of that should be addressed in your IEP meeting. You want to find out exactly what extent your student will be participating in all different types of activities at school. Is there going to be a difference with how they're seated at activities in, in their own classroom, in assemblies, in gym class, et cetera, whether there is a difference in how your student will be treated on a consistent basis in terms of student placement, you know, do they sit at a table by themselves? Do they sit with other people? Are there other students with IEPs in their classroom? Are there not? These are questions you want to ask because you want to know exactly what's going on. You know, this is your opportunity to ask all the questions. This is what the IEP team is there for. There's also obviously a consent section at the bottom of the IEP. And that'll be the place where you really do have the time to go over the plan, make sure you understand everything that's on it, and then consent to the accommodations that they intend to put into place. I would say another thing to do is to write down everything. Even at this IEP meeting, you might want to ask, is it okay if I have my phone recorder on? Just because sometimes in a meeting, you know, things go over your head. There's several different people, several different agendas. While everyone's there to help your child, you might miss one thing or another. And, you know, you don't want to waste their time. They don't want to waste yours. So having a voice recording of it might be helpful so that you can listen to it again, especially if one spouse doesn't get to come to the meeting and you just get to have a, a complete picture of it. You get to sit with it in your own time without any nerves and go over all the details again. Write down everything. Take a notebook with you to the IEP meeting. Write down who's there, who's going to be there, your point person of contact, all of these bullet points that you're hearing as you go through the IEP plan, go ahead and write it down. And I would say write it down in a dedicated notebook. Have an IEP notebook or an IEP binder where you put in this information. A binder is especially useful because you can have blank notes at the front, you can have dated you know, agenda meeting notes almost of what was discussed at every IEP meeting. You can have the printout of how the IEP is evolving over time. Because like anything else, this is a process, right? Your first IEP and the way it's put together might not be the way it looks at the end. And that actually shows an IEP team that's working with you, that is striving with you to adjust to meet the needs of your child. So have that all in a binder, have it all in one place, have your you know, student's diagnosis in that binder, have any kind of research in that binder, have notes that you take off of videos like this in that binder. Information like this is useful to share with your IEP team. You have to realize that although a lot of professionals in the field know a lot about these children and about how to help them best, some of them aren't parents and some of them are definitely not parents of neuroatypical children. So what you can teach them also is helpful so what you learn can be something that you bring up in the IEP meeting. You can give them reference notes of what book you had been reading or what video you saw and send it to them. And that is something that, you know, it all depends on the team you have. But the more you know, the more you know, right? Do advanced work before you go to your IEP meetings, really. Like try to be up on what you might hear at that meeting. Review with your kid, you know, like how's it been going? Stay open with them about you know, what the goals are, how their progress is, that mistakes are proof that we're learning, you know, keeping that growth mindset with them, but stay, keep them in the picture. You know, this is about them. This isn't about you. And this isn't about the IEP team. And this isn't about their teacher. This is about them. This is about your kid. So keep them in that process. I really believe that the more we can empower our kids to understand that they have a neuroatypical brain, but that is not in any way their fault that is not in any way like a horrible negative, you know, that is something that they have to work with. That is the race car that they are. And now they have to take care of it and hone it the best they can, right? So this team is there to help you. That's what I really want to emphasize. A lot of people will advise with IEP meetings that you make it personal, that you bring pictures of your kid from home, that you really give the team an idea of who your child is as a whole. Your child isn't just the student 
creating a ruckus in their classroom environment. Your child isn't just the student who never turns in homework. Your child might also be a great pianist or a great basketball player or a hilarious, you know, comedian at home. Make your child a person for them, not just another thing for them to check off their list. It's really important that everybody keep their eye on that that ball, you know, the kid. <laughs> the kid is the ball. Sometimes when you go to these IEP meetings, um, people show up on their own. I really advise against that. Bring someone, even if your spouse can't come, bring your best friend or, you know, the child's aunt or uncle. Bring someone else who's not as intimately involved with it as you so that they can be a little bit more objective, so that they can hear the things that you might have missed. Um, just so you have a supportive presence there. It can be very intimidating to be the one parent in the room. And that's something I totally understand. Um, being a parent myself who got a lot of phone calls from my child's teacher, it's not an antagonistic relationship, but you definitely start to feel like the teacher may not like your child and that creates its own feelings, right? So it's helpful sometimes to just have somebody else who you know is on your side for sure <laughs> to be sitting next to you. Another thing I would say is really keep an open mind. Keep an open mind about the team, about the teacher, about their suggestions. While they may not be parents, and while they may not be the parents of a neuroatypical child, in general, the people on that team want to help your child. And in general, they want to do their best at their job as well. And so keep an open mind. They have had a lot of experience with a lot of different children who have IEPs. They have seen certain things fail and certain things succeed. And while every child is an individual and every family has its own needs, and every school is different and every teacher is different, I think it's helpful to keep an open mind that they might have suggestions that are worthwhile, even if they kind of sit wrong at the beginning. You know, definitely follow your gut, but also leave room for the possibility that they might have more experience in this than you. Again, this is an evolving process. When you try different things, you know, follow your best instincts. You know your child best, but have an open mind go in with the presumption that everyone there is on your kid's side. That when you come in with that attitude, when you come in with that positive collaborative spirit, it sort of encourages everyone else to be on, on that team as well. That is my best advice to you. Don't go in assuming that it's you against them. Really think of it as a team huddle and present your child to them as a great kid. Be honest about what has been going on but also be honest about all the amazing things about your kid. You are not in this position where you have to just suck up anything or just feel bad or anything. Yeah. School can be a difficult environment for neuroatypical children. School can be a difficult environment for neurotypical children, but the specific challenges of being neuroatypical in a world that is built entirely for the most high functioning neurotypical individuals is hard. And I think that's, these are all things that we can say to the team. You know, we can acknowledge reality while also saying my kid is great. How can we make this a great year for them? So to sum up, what would I say? Be prepared, go in with a team attitude, keep records of everything and notes on everything, keep an IEP binder, have really measurable goals and a way for everyone on the team to communicate that progress together. Datability is a great option for that. I encourage you to look into it. All of the links will be in the description box down below. I'm not an affiliate. This is not a sponsored video. They simply sent it to me for free and you know, access for a few weeks so that I could see how the program worked so that I could share it with you guys. And I really do think it's an incredible tool. Um, as always, you guys, I hope that you go over to Danielle's channel. Again, her son does go to school, so I'm sure she has a lot of insight into this issue. And I appreciate you spending some of your time with me. I know that time is scarce, and so I really do appreciate it. And as always, I wish you the very best day.